Good morning. I am Chancellor Robert Jones, and I want to welcome everyone to our great conversation with Dr. Freeman Rybrowski. As a land-grant institution, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign has the responsibility to acknowledge the historical context in which it exists. In order to remind ourselves and our community, we will begin this event with the following statement. We're currently on the lands of the Peoria, the Kaskaskia, the Biancasha, the Wea, the Miami, the Moscouton, the Odawa, the Sauk, the Meskwaki, the Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. It is necessary for us to acknowledge these native nations and for us to work with them as we move forward as an institution. Over the next 150 years and beyond, we will be a vibrant community, inclusive of all of our differences with native people at the core of our efforts. Here at Illinois, we began most important events like this one with that land acknowledgement statement. We do it because it's important for all of us who become part of this university to truly understand the path and the people who came before us and who had a historical role in shaping this place that brings all of us together. Again, good morning, uh, Dr. Rybrowski. Uh, welcome to this university and thank you for joining us for our great conversation series that happens to fall on this day when we celebrate indigenous people here in Illinois. And I am very, very sorry that due to COVID-19, it prevents us from having this conversation in person, uh, but we are still greatly appreciative of your being here. And we look forward to your remarks and a very robust dialogue. But whether it's in Zoom or standing on or sitting on a stage together, I can tell you, I am equally excited to have you with us for this inaugural event uh, the purpose of the great conversation is really an opportunity to bring to Illinois some of the leading voices that are working at the leading edge of addressing society's most challenging issues and most critical issues. And our guest today clearly exemplifies that purpose. Educational access and success for all is most certainly one of those pressing challenges. And Freeman Rabrowski has spent his career pioneering new and innovative and sustainable approaches to increase in participation and performance of underrepresented students, particularly in STEM fields. Today's conversation, Freeman will start us off with some formal remarks entitled, The Empowered University, Shared Leadership in Challenging Times. And at the conclusion of those remarks, he and I will then spend the rest of the hour in a more informal open conversation and dialogue about the issues he raised in his comments and about his most recent book and about his perspective on the future of higher education in a world of COVID-19. I also want to remind those of you watching that you can purchase a signed copy of Freeman's book the Empowered University through the link that is listed on our Great Conversation webpage. And also the ending slide of today's program will also have that information. All proceeds for the sale of this book go to support student scholarships at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. So with that, I would like us to get the conversation started. But before I turn the program over to Freeman, I would be remiss if I didn't offer just a bit more formal introduction of, uh, for our audience uh, benefit today. And I'm not doing this because I believe, Freeman, they don't know who you are. Everybody knows who you are, so that's not the issue. Uh, you are a household name uh, for those of us in higher education, as well as those outside of higher education, as well as we will see and some of the awards and accolades that you receive. 
but I want everyone to truly understand the scale and the scope of your accomplishments and the achievements over your career. Freeman has served as the president of UMBC, the University of Maryland, Baltimore County since 1992. He leads the university that has been recognized as a model of inclusive excellence by some publications such as US News, which the past 10 years now has recognized UMBC as a national leader in academic innovation and undergraduate teaching. His own research and publication focuses on science and math education with special emphasis on minority participation and performance. He chaired the National Academies Committee that produced a report expanding underrepresented minority participation, colon, America's science and technology talent at the crossroads. He was named in 2012 by President Obama to chair the President's Advisory Commission on Educational Excellence for African Americans. And you may very well have seen or heard his TED talk highlighting the four pillars of college success in science. Listing his honors and wars and recognition would take more time than I've been allotted today. But it's important for me to note that he's been listed as one of America's best leaders by US News. Time Magazine first ranked him among the top 10 college presidents and then later named him as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. He is a recipient of the American Council on Education Lifetime Achievement Award, and he is a member of the Academy, American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And he holds honorary degrees from more than 40 universities, including one here from the University of Middle Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. That 2004 edition actually brought the grand total of Freeman's Illinois diplomas to three because he earned his master's degree here in mathematics and his doctorate from the College of Education. We are so very, very proud to claim him as a member of our alumni family. And I am so deeply honored to share this virtual platform for this first great conversation with someone that I've grown to just really respect and admire, and that is Dr. Freeman Rebrowski. And I, I'm just sorry, Freeman, that we can't do this in person and you cannot hear the very loud applause that would be going on right now uh, based on this introduction of you. So welcome virtually back to uh, the University of Illinois, Havana champaign And so now, Freeman, the virtual stage is yours. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you very, very much, Robert. This is a, an amazing moment for me uh, for, for so many reasons. First of all, let me congratulate you on your leadership there. Uh, I was delighted when you moved from SUNY Albany to Illinois, and I said he's going to my alma mater, and uh, you are one of those thought leaders in the country. I've known you since Minnesota and knew you were going to be a, a chancellor or president for sure. Uh, and I was delighted when you brought Wanda Ward, my colleague from NSF, because she's a thought leader in science policy and education. And I'm delighted to see what the kinds of things you're doing right now. Uh, you may not know this, but this is actually the 50th anniversary of, of my new wife and mine moving to the University of Illinois. We had just graduated from our beloved Hampton. And right after our wedding in August, we moved to grad school at Illinois. To, so we always say we had our honeymoon at Urbana-Champaign. Um, but I tell you that because all that I have achieved in my life and the work that my colleagues and I are doing, much of that has been shaped by my experiences at the University of Illinois. I'm very proud to be an alumnus of your campus. I actually gave a um, I've given many talks talking about my experience. And one of the points I often make is that while it was culture shock to go from an HBCU from Hampton to Illinois, there were people there on that campus who helped me to succeed from um, Clarence Shelley and Greta Hogan, who worked with me with the Upward Bound program to Bob Waller, a professor of history there, who, whom I worked under in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Um, 
all the way to people who inspired grad students there, like Jim Anderson, who was uh, uh, about to graduate with his PhD from there. And we all wanted to be like Jim somehow. And so when I think about the Empowered University, I always think about ways in which institutions inspire people. And it, it's through the people, the kinds of people I mentioned, the Boxdales, those who've been around for a long time would appreciate that. But one other person who inspired me uh, and who was my professor was actually one of your former leaders of the University of Illinois system, David Dodds Henry. Uh, David uh, had um, uh, been there at Illinois from 1955 uh, uh, to 1971 as the, the leader of the system. And um, somebody else who was always supportive, Jack Pelzerson, who always talked about the fact that 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 head of that system understood his role just as the head of the campus must understand his role. And I learned a lot from looking at their relationship because I moved to Illinois in 1970, as I said, 50 years ago. And it was in 2003, 17 years ago, that I gave the David Dodds Henry lecture. And I want to quote one statement that came from uh, him, from President Henry. He said, there can be little doubt that higher education has survived periods of stress and crisis and gone on to new levels of achievement because the public has been aware of the interaction between higher education and social progress. And so in national emergencies of depression, of war, people have turned to organized higher education to our colleges and universities and its faculty and graduates for assistance. And I think about this time as we go through the challenges of COVID, the challenges of social justice and structural racism being highlighted as one of our major, major issues in this country, the, the challenges of political division of the economic issues that we face. And I, I first want to commend the University of Illinois, Urbana Champaign, for the role you're playing in the country and in, your, and in our state, in Illinois, that is in that you think about uh, what you're doing in science and what you've done with testing and saliva testing, for example, and the fact that people realize you've made a difference in looking at how we get people to understand the importance of science when dealing with healthcare, uh, when thinking about your Illinois commitment, your, your commitment to, to families with under, I think, $67,000 and the need to have greater access, um, and many other ways in which you're working. We have to say that you should be empowered to understand those strengths. And at the same time, to think about the challenges that you face. I often talk about being from the South. Robert, you're from the South. Wanda's from the South. Jim Anderson's from the South. <laughs> and and um, we Southerners love to weave stories. We love stories. And I'm always telling stories. And I, I tell the story of... Uh, being in the back of church in 1963 and not wanting to be there. And my parents placated me with the two things I loved most, food and mathematics. I always got goosebumps doing, food, uh, doing mathematics, and they enjoyed me getting fatter and fatter as I loved the math. And so I was eating M&Ms, the good kind with the peanuts. And and all of a sudden, the gentleman at the lectern said, if the children participate in this peaceful protest, all of America will understand that even our young people, our children, know the difference between right and wrong. And they will be able to go to better schools. And I looked up, because I'm, I'm thinking we're going to better schools. I, we had some great Black teachers. We really did. They did not have the resources that the white schools had. And all I could remember was that we were given these hand-me-down books, these books with brown paper bags around them after white children had finished. Imagine the psychological impact. And I looked up and said, who is that guy? And his name, of course, was Dr. Martin Luther King. And I went home and said to my parents, I must go. And of course they said, no, you cannot. Uh, and um, they sent me to my room because I called them hypocrites. And the next morning they came in and said, it wasn't that we didn't trust you. We didn't trust the people who will be over you because if you march, you will go to jail. And indeed they did allow me to go. And I did spend five days in jail. And it was a horrific time when children were treated like animals and slaves. It was awful, not enough bathrooms, sleeping on the floor, 
children crying. And in the middle of the week, Dr. King came and said, what you children do this day will have an impact on children who've not yet been born. And while we didn't fully understand it, we knew there was something special about that statement. Well, that same year, we saw the four little girls being bombed. We saw the tragedy of President Kennedy being killed. Uh, we saw the march on Washington, the march in, uh, on, uh, in, in, uh, in Selma. And all of a sudden, America began to say, we could be better than this. And within a few months, in 1964, um, President Johnson, uh, the master of the Senate, as he was called, was able to get the civil rights legislation and in 65, the Voting Rights and the, and the Higher Education Act. Now, why do I go through all of that? The point is this, to understand today's dilemma, the challenges we face in our country, it is so important to have context for those in the humanities and social sciences to appreciate, who really appreciate the fact that we, we have to understand our history if we are to think about where we're going. And so when my students ask uh, and say to me rather, doc, things have never been this bad. Uh, I'm saying, no, go back to the 60s. And they look at me and I say the 1960s or the 1860s because the country in both cases, very divided. And yet what we saw through that period was several things, several things I can tell you that were particularly important. Number one, all of a sudden, we could look at the number of people who had gone to college. And in the mid 60s, only 10% of Americans had graduated from college. And if you broke it down by black and white at that time, you had only about three to 4% of blacks, most of whom had gone to the HBCUs in the deep south. And uh, on the other hand, only 11% of whites had gone to college. So most Americans today don't realize that in the 60s, almost 90% of families had never had anyone, had seen no one go and graduate from college. Now, today we are up to 30%. Uh, and the numbers, if I, if, I were, if I were there with you, I'd be asking you to give me what you think of as the percentages. And most of you would be surprised to see that, uh, quite frankly, uh, only 20%, 22, 23% of Blacks, only 30, approximately 37, 38% of Whites, um, and only 15% of Latinx and a smaller percentage of Native Americans had graduated from college. For the Asian population, it's slightly above 50% because many come to this country uh, and their kids go to college. Many come to grad school here, uh, but there are still certain Asian populations that have not had those advantages. What am I saying? I'm telling you today that two thirds of Americans are from families where no one has graduated from a four year institution. And so when I think about what we talk about in our book, The Empowered University, I'm thinking about the need for every institution to look in the mirror at both self, at the institution, at all of us as faculty and staff, and at our entire society. You know, Eric Weiner wrote the book Geography of Bliss, in which he says, culture is the sea we swim in, so all-consuming that we fail to recognize it until we step out of it and look back at the situation. And so I invite you to step out of the culture of the University of Illinois, the culture even of America, to look at some of the challenges we face today. Structural racism, we know, is real. When you look at the criminal justice system, when you look at health care and the health disparities, when you look at academic achievement, we know there are major challenges. It was a major study done by the National Academy of Sciences on criminal justice several years ago that said, make no mistake, much of this has to do with structural racism at many levels. And I tell you that because now is the opportunity. Here we have the opportunity to look at what we can do to have an impact on society, but to also look at what we need to do to get our own houses in order. My campus is one that has students from 100 countries and about half the students are in STEM areas. 40% of all of our students go to grad school uh, heavily our professional schools, and we have produced large numbers of people who are now leading in their fields. But here is the point I would make to you, that the question becomes, who are we as a university when thinking about having a, an impact on the larger society? Uh, you know that the American higher education community was very sorry when we saw that in your state for several years, you were not seeing the investments 
from your state government. Uh, and that people seem not to appreciate the power and the, 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 the potential, the capacity of higher education to change lives. And while the University of Illinois has always done well, you are the leading institution, the leading public institution. And I challenge you to think about, so what role are you playing in helping for the majority of students and citizens in your state beyond those who are most privileged? And while it is true, you will now have this financial commitment to those below $67,000. The big question you're going to have to ask, the ineluctable question is, how many poor children will have the academic skills to come to the University of Illinois? And there is a part of the challenge that we all face, that just as we talk about what we do with students on our campus, the question is, what role must we play in strengthening pre-K through 12 education? We've worked to do that in a variety of ways on my own campus. And we're still working on it. I don't know any place that has gotten it right, that has figured it out. But when people tell me what they are doing, the question I always ask is, so why is it that, that large numbers of children who are not from privilege are not reading well, are not with the skills they need to go to the more selective institutions? And similarly, the work that my campus is focused on heavily has to do with broad diversity in our society, given the large numbers of people who are from of groups of color and how that is becoming increasingly the case. In your state, you see it. You know that your numbers on your campus at the student level, at the faculty level, do not reflect the Illinois population. But that is true on most of our campuses, that we have a way to go. Uh, the, the, the program that we'll talk about today, that Robert and I will talk about, will be the Milehoff program, which has been able to increase substantially the number of our African Americans and other students of color who have done so well in science and engineering that they moved on to PhDs and MD PhDs. In fact, we are the leading university in the country in producing blacks at the bachelor's level who go on to complete MD PhDs by a fact of two and a half to one. We're number one, Harvard is number two. We produced more than twice as many as they have over the past two decades. And so we can talk about that and what the TED talk that, that Robert mentioned can mean as we think about what other institutions can do to increase these numbers. But the, the holy grail, as we know, is the professoriate. And when we think about where can we make the biggest difference, we need to see people who are of different backgrounds so that students of all backgrounds can know it is possible. And you know that you know, whether it's my campus or your campus, we have a long way to go. If you get a chance, look at our STRIDE program, S-T-R-I-D-E, We've worked to increase the numbers of faculty in the arts, humanities, social sciences, and another program in the, uh, in the science and engineering area. But bringing in postdocs and bringing in faculty and giving them a couple of years before going on the tenure track and having champions to work with them can make a huge difference. You know, what I want you to think about is the fact that without universities and colleges, most of us would not be where we are today. We know that Robert and I were just saying, where would we be two little boys of color coming out of Georgia and Alabama if it had not been for the education? And so we must be the people. We must be empowered to tell our stories, our individual stories, our stories of universities, the story of Illinois that brought in children from Chicago and other places, that 500 group that just had gotten there a couple of years before um, my wife and I moved there as young grad students and to talk about how those students did and how it helped many of them to get to move to the next level, but to also talk about the culture of the campus and the impact that the campus had on them. It took years for my wife and me to feel better and better about the University of Illinois because we remembered some feelings that were not as positive, but we also remembered the people on the campus of Professor Joanne Fly and others for me and who did make a difference. And so I want to challenge you, Urbana Champagne, to look in the mirror and to think about who you want to become. You have such a great history. You are doing so many things right now. And yet, as my campus would say, success is never final. There's much work to do. You are one of the leading research institutions in our country. And I challenge you to be better than you ever thought possible. It never occurred to me that the young woman who has just recently gotten a patent on the COVID vaccine 
affiliated with Moderna would be black. She's one of my students, one of our students who went on to from UMBC to Chapel Hill, coming out of a rural part of North Carolina to UMBC, a Maha scholar. And so I often tell CEOs, when you get that vaccine, I want you to see the face of a young black woman making history in the world. This is what we need. We need to see all the talent from all these populations and what they can do. It didn't occur to me that the young investigator getting the single most prestigious award of the Neuroscience Society last year was black. And one of our graduates who went on is now a professor uh, at tenured faculty at Duke, MD, PhD in neurobiology. What am I saying? I'm saying that you, the University of Illinois, who's now gotten in the top 10 in producing blacks who get PhDs in the life sciences, the only three campuses that are not HBCUs doing that. You have made progress, but I know with the richness of the, the brain power there that you can do even more. I leave you with a quote from a great American woman, uh, a mentor and champion to my hero, Mary McLeod Bethune. And that hero that I'm talking about right now, that heron is Eleanor Roosevelt, who said, the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. The future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. We are people who dream. We are standing on the shoulders who people, of people who won the great university in Urbana-Champaign and all the people who moved us to where we are today. Watch your thoughts, they become your words. Your words become your actions. Your actions become your habits. Your habits become your character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny dreams and values. Illinois, my beloved alma mater, you are so special and you can be even better. Thank you. Well, Freeman, let me start by uh, saying thank you for those amazing comments. And uh, uh, you've given us a lot to think about, a lot to reflect upon as we do the thing that is most difficult for us to do as humankind is to take that deep look in the mirror and be unapologetically honest with ourselves about who we are and who we aspire to be. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. You know, let me begin our conversation and I know we don't have much time, but I have to say I would be remiss if I, I didn't start with what is probably I'm willing to bet you a question that you get a lot, given the uniqueness, not only of your surname, but your first name. <laughs> I know there has to be a much more interesting story behind that than my own situation. We know, like yourself, most African Americans born and of the South for hundreds of years were named after slave owners, plantation masters, and there must have been a lot of Joneses that owned uh, plantations because there's <laughs> more Joneses uh, in the world than you can, in the country, you can shake a stick at. But I have to admit, there, uh, other than you, I don't know of any other Robrowskis. So there must be a good story behind your first name and your surname. Sure. So share that with our listeners. Sure. And I, I will tell you the story. I, if you get a chance, look at, there's a 60 minutes piece on the UMBC and the Maha program. And, and uh, Byron waited until after 10 months of interviews uh, on camera to ask me exactly that question. So I, I'm accustomed to it. And I certainly got it while, while I was at Illinois. Uh, in fact, especially from Polish professors in mathematics, the, um, my great great grandfather was the Polish slave master. And uh, indeed people in the South understand those things. In fact, we have furniture in the house from that plantation below Selma, Alabama. And my, my grand, I'm Freeman Rabowski III. My grandfather was of the first generation. He wasn't quite the first one born, but he was the first generation of his brothers and sisters born free. He was born in about 1870. And they named him Freeman rather than freed man uh, because he was uh, just that, a free man. And there's my name, Freeman Rabowski. <laughs>
So I told you it was an interesting story. So thank you for sharing that with me. Sure. The other unique thing about you, uh, as soon as I became aware of your leadership uh, way back in the 90s, oh, uh, I think you started out as a vice provost at UMBC. And ultimately in 1992, you became the, uh, I think maybe you were a chancellor because of nomenclature change right. system at that time. But uh, and uh, you've been serving uh, more than three decades in, in that role, or approaching three decades. And uh, that's unusual within itself. And I'm, I'm going to take a wild guess here. I suspect that you're probably one of the, if not the longest serving president of a public university in terms of your tenure at one place. And uh, so I'd like to, uh, I got a couple of questions to ask about that, but I also know you graduated from Hampton University and there's a guy there named uh, Bill Harvey, who's been there almost 42 years now. So what's up with this Hampton and producing ah, people ah, ah. that stay in leadership roles ah. for decades? <laughs> you know, and, and Bill is my dear friend and we love Hampton. Hampton, Jack and I grew up at Hampton. Jack and Hampton prepared us, by the way, for Illinois, my math professor, one of my math professors, one of my few black math professors at Hampton had a degree from Illinois, actually. And that's how I learned about it, Geraldine Darden. That's how I learned about uh, the University of Illinois. But but what I would say is that for, for presidents, um, the chemistry between the president or the chancellor and the faculty is critical, just as is that, that chemistry between that leader of the campus and the board uh, and whoever is with the board, you know, it's just, uh, and, and when there is, and for me, what I can say is that I have been very fortunate to be on a campus um, with whom I have very similar values. The first sentence in the book, this Empowered University book says, uh, it's not about me, it's about us. We've made so much progress and um, Americans, and perhaps human beings have the tendency to point to the leader when something happens, either good or bad. It's always the leader. It's that person's fault or that person's responsibility. Um, and so I've been given much too much credit is what I'm saying, that it has been because of very, very committed faculty and staff and their values in changing our campus, in reshaping the culture, to become more inclusive of people from different backgrounds. Uh, and, and, and so when I think about longevity and presidencies, I think about the health of those relationships, mm -hmm. that if the relationships are strong, then we help each other. As I work with new presidents in the Harvard program for and, and have for years, I'm always saying, um, the more integrity you show them, and you know this, when you are honest and you say, I, I can do this, this did not work out, I need help people will tend to help you. When we get into difficulty at any level is when we lie. When we lie, it's very hard to be trusted by people. And that's, so I've blown, I've had a lot of mistakes over the years, but, but I can say, I've been able to say, please help me, I need help, and they've done that. Well, I appreciate you mentioning the first uh, sentence in the preface of your book, because that was my next question. Uh -huh. uh, because as you uh, talk about your longevity, I, I suspected that, it in part was shaped by your upbringing, uh, what you experienced uh, growing up in Alabama, what you experienced at Hampton, what you experienced here at Illinois helped shape your perspective on the world and, and, I, and, and who you are and how you present yourself to the world. Because I can tell you, uh, it's probably no exaggeration to say with someone is highly recognized and who's been really visible in talking about change and demonstrating what can be done in higher education. It's probably easy to, to kind of slip into, well, look at what I did. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm gratified that the first words in your book was, it's not about me, yeah. it's about us. And yeah. just glad to, you've already answered my question, so I'll let it go. But I had a strong feeling that that shaped your leadership style and your longevity at UMBC. So you know, just just a comment. The older I've gotten, the more I've appreciated the the value of humility. Um, it, of course, it's important to 
have confidence and to teach our students to have a sense of self. Uh, Hampton prepared me to go into all white classrooms at Illinois, mainly white males, quite frankly, in math uh, that first year. And, and even after that, some women, but, but it was that sense of self. And then having some professors, whether Professor Boxdale or Joanne Fly and some others who said, you can do this. It was, it was Joanne Fly, uh, one of the few women professors there in higher ed who, who said, you're gonna be a president one day. And, uh, and who pushed me to think broadly about the possibilities. Fantastic. Well, let's shift a bit to talk about another core aspect, I think, of longevity. And given the fact that you've been at UMBC um, across uh, three decades, um, you talk in your books at length, and I can tell you, um, I know when you read, you're supposed to only highlight the important things uh, that the writer is trying to portray. And darn it, for this chapter, the almost 60% of it is highlighted because there are so many thought provoking. Uh, tidbits that you provide about the issue of culture. And uh, just want to just, you, you mentioned this in your opening remarks about culture is a sea we swim in uh, from Eric uh, 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 Weiner's book. Um, you must have seen, I'm sure that you talk about this a bit in the book, that was a culture that was there when you were a junior administrator. And you've had to change the opportunity to shape that culture across three decades. Yeah. And I'm sure that culture has shifted and modified and apparently has improved over those three decades. But yeah. how does one come into an institution, the kind of a fledgling institution that you came into, and then nurture it consistently and persistently across the decades? Uh, and I suspect that, uh, you know, you as, even though you're humble about this, you played a major role in helping to perpetuate a culture that has allowed this institution to surface as a top 10 producer of innovation and other accolades that's been bestowed upon it. So could you talk a little bit about this cultural change piece and particularly comment about the comments that you made to a group of university presidents uh, about change and about culture. I, I thought that was good. <laughs> I had been, I was on, we were at the White House and uh, a number of presidents and one of my dear friends was talking about the amazing changes at his institution and he has made amazing changes. And, but, uh, and people are aware, but, but, but he was talking in a way that made it sound like it just happened. He was able to do it. And, um, I knew what my fellow presidents were thinking. They were thinking, uh, and I said, when, when I spoke, I said, you know, I, I applaud you for, for what you've been able to do. I said, and I've been president at that time, I don't know, 20 years, I said, but let me tell you, changing the culture of a university is hard as hell. It's as hard as hell. And that was, you would have thought it was a basketball game. All these presidents lost their dignity and started applauding because they knew exactly what I was saying. It does not happen easily. And it's not top down, and it does take people working together to build consensus. If it's something that's going to last once the president has gone, for example, uh, and and it, it is certainly the truth. On our campus, um, we had a we we had a way of thinking about performance, particularly in science and engineering, that said, well, quite frankly, only the strongest will survive. And um, we called the first two years of science what American institutions call them, and that's weed out courses. That we do tend to weed out at any university, research university to liberal arts college, large percentages of the students weed. This is a part of what my TED talk says. It is also in the report that I chaired for the National Academies on underrepresentation in science. Only, it, it doesn't surprise people that only 20% of Blacks and Hispanics who begin with a major in science will graduate with a bachelor's in that. But it does surprise people that only 32% of whites and only 41% of Asians will graduate in those areas. Uh, and we tend to say it's because they didn't have a K through 12 background. And what we do is we tend to, we do what we do in, a, in our country, 
colleges blame the high schools, who blame the elementary schools, who blame the family, and the husband will say it's the wife's part of the family. That's the problem. We all blame somebody else, right? But we did something a little different. And I had colleagues there from Harvard and MIT to Howard to Miami Dade College um, uh, as a community college. We were looking at to the University of Texas. And what we saw was that often the stronger the academic background of the student and the more socially prestigious the university, the greater the student would leave science within the first year or two. It was fascinating to see that. And that doesn't mean large numbers were not graduating, but the base started at a much, much higher level or much many more people, but large numbers of students will, will, will start off in pre-med or in engineering or in science, and they change their majors often because they got a C in that first course, whether it was organic chemistry or first chemistry, and, and large numbers of those with AP courses start at a higher level and they don't do as well. I mean, having worked on those exams for years, I know that um, what we see on the AP exams in chemistry and physics will be formulaic problems. What you get in a, in a college level college course will be different in, in that I may give you five problems in math, three you've seen before, two you've not seen before, and you can immediately find yourself not doing well. The point becomes the culture on our campus was those who were extraordinarily well prepared and got support were making it in science and engineering but black kids, Latino kids, uh, and most white students were not doing well. And we thought that meant we were of high quality because we tend to say that the most of the programs that are, are the most prestigious and the high quality programs don't let many people through is the idea. We, the colleagues and I, my colleagues and I really rethought that idea and found many students who did have preparation, who had done well on SATs and AP exams, but who were not making it. And the question became, how might we change the definition of high quality? Not simply to mean those who don't make it, but rather to talk about rigor of work and level of support given to help people come up to the standard, to keep the standard high, but to say we can do much more to help those students to succeed in those courses. And that included everything from redesigning courses, uh, if you get a chance to look at our chemistry discovery center, or we have what we call the Rabowski Innovation Grants. For my 20th anniversary, the campus decided to do a fundraiser and they did raise quite a bit of money for an endowment on innovation. And then I did not want it named after me. I said, if you name it after me, I, I'll seem like I'm dead or something. You name things after people who are dead. <laughs> so, but they did name it the Rabowski Innovation Fund. And we give out a number of grants, not just in science and engineering, but across disciplines that are focused on innovation in first, the first two years of the work. How can we bring more interdisciplinarity? How do we connect the work more with what's happening in the larger society? How do we have more students from different backgrounds to succeed? And it's worked quite well. Uh, this, is, this is really uh, remarkable. And I, I think it uh, begs a, a few additional questions in this regard, because it is very, very clear that under your leadership and of course, with your able colleagues, you've been able to do what many institutions have struggled to do for decades. And you're doing it at scale. And we'll talk about the Meyerhoff program a little bit later, but uh, money can't be this, the only ingredient of your success. Right, right. And if you could talk a little bit of more, I understand the curricular changes, but seems to me you've created kind of a climate and an ecosystem where students who may not be the top in that class are able to come to UMBC, get the kind of nurturing and support they need, and they can perform at par uh, with majority students and go on to get PhDs and MDs at record levels. What would be your advice other than the one that you offered for us in your opening remarks about taking that strong uh, deep look in the mirror what are some other take-home lessons for the rest of us sure. and the rest of the entities across this country that still struggle with the issue of getting more uh, unrepresented uh, so-called minority kids into college in the first place and particularly getting more into uh, uh, into universities, uh, you know, of the scale and size of Illinois is something that I'd be really interested in your perspective on. You've done it at UMBC, uh, and how do you help folks like myself 
figure out how we can do it at scale in a way that we also can be a transformation. I appreciate that. And, and what we learned from the Maha program has helped us with other programs on the campus. And I'll tell you what I mean. And of course, the Maha program was designed to increase the number of Blacks who um, were able to not only get a degree, a bachelor's in science or engineering, but who had done so well that they would be interested in going on to get a PhD or an MD, PhD, and in some cases MD, uh, and be qualified to enter those programs. And uh, in one year alone, we had 12 of the UMBC students uh, interviewed at the Harvard Medical School. Half were minorities, were Black, for example. So from Harvard to Stanford. But he here is here is the point. Um, number one, understanding the backgrounds of students who are succeeding by race. I mean, we have uh, the use of analytics, something we have focused on for years. Uh, and it's just gotten more and more sophisticated. And we've written a number of articles on this. And, and so even when I talk about uh, African-American students, for example, not necessarily being quite as well prepared as some of my other students, we have to understand what that means on my campus. The, the Baltimore Washington Carter is um, one of the leading parts of the country in science and engineering research. As you know, all the national agencies, NIH and others, and many high school kids get involved in that. Um, the largest minority group on my campus is Asian. We are more than 25% Asian. We are probably 16, 17% Black, and then some Latino. So we are about half and half minority and half white. Now, um, the fact is that students, my, my Asian students and white students who have the perfect AP or perfect math scores have much more than that. They have the experience of working in NIH as a high school student, okay? Or of having a father or a mother who's a scientist. And so that way of thinking all our lives. Now, my black kids in some cases may have something similar to that, but in many cases will not. They may have the A's, they have solid test scores. They may not be perfect, but they have solid test. And we have actually gone to look at what's the minimum level score we can expect in a particular discipline and see that the student has a reasonable chance of succeeding. And, and that math SAT, a level of reading will be very important but there is a range in those scores. So the Meyerhoff's, by the use right now, the Meyerhoff SATs are from the 12 to the 1400 range, something like that, uh, with, with, with some kids in the lower 12s. Competing against though, my white students who have a high score. So test scores are not everything, we know that. And in some disciplines, they can be more important than others. But we also look at whether the child or the student had an opportunity to do test prep. The more advantaged the student is, the more opportunities for test prep. We know that. Um, and, and so we, I, I learned so much about that, by the way, at the University of Illinois when I directed the Upward Bound program as a grad student. And to see what we could do to build those reading skills and the word problem skills and those kinds of things. Uh, and, and what I would tell you is that um, for years, we use the, the approach that I talked about in the David Dodds Henry uh, lecture on the Du Bois finding the talented 10th. Uh, too often, people are turned off by the notion of find the very top students. Well, we don't say that about basketball. We know that Illinois goes for the best basketball players. We don't go for the very best. We don't have the reputation in sports or the money. We did beat UEA. We did get the NCAA <laughs> history marked by being the number 16 seed to be the number one seed. But those were nerdy kids who just by chance were talented and, and somehow people took us for granted and it worked. It was wonderful. We'll be talking about that for the rest of my life. All right. <laughs> but I mean, you all are powerhouse academically and athletically, okay? So you go for the very best in athletics. And, and what I would suggest is you should be going for the very best. And I'm sure you do, but you wanna be known for that. And what we worked to do was to get students who were looking at MIT and Harvard to come to us because what we could show after a number of years was that the kids who turned us down for Malhoff and went to the most prestigious places socially were not succeeding in science. And yet we could send our kids on to MIT and Stanford and other places 
and they would do well because of the approach we took. And much of that approach came out of the experience I had at an HBCU in Hampton, the nurturing environment, building community, but also what we learned to do at Illinois for undergrad students when I was there and running a math tutoring center and getting them to work with each other, you see, and getting finding those faculty and, and grad students willing to work with them to build community. Because that's the point of the TED Talk, high expectations, not just for the students, but for our faculty to think about what else can we do? Building community, it takes researchers to produce researchers, getting them into labs. Our top students are publishing in referee journals as second office and sometimes as first office and then evaluating what we're doing. So the, 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 the final point would be this, Robert, that somehow looking at the students you have right now to determine who are the ones who are succeeding. Right. When I tell you that you've made it to the top 10 uh, in uh, produce a black bachelor's recipients who've gone on to get PhDs in life sciences. First thing I would ask you, the ineluctable question is, do you know who those students are? And that's over a period of 10 years. Who are those students? Where are they now? What can you learn from them? Look at their records, their test scores, understand the interaction. So in analytics, dive deeply into your success as you think about how to move the next group. Because for us, once we began to have the success, the talented 10th notion is make them the people everybody aspires to be. Okay. When I first started with the students, I mean, people were upset. Why are you working with the best students? Because they don't make it in science. Even our best, I mean, under 2% of the scientists at NIH are black. At all the national agencies, when I chaired that Obama Commission on Educational Excellence, we looked at all the data. At all the national agencies, we could not find one national agency where 2% of the scientists are Black. So even the best prepared are not succeeding. They often change their majors or they don't go to get PhDs or MD PhDs. So I would say to you, dive into your strengths first. Understand who those have made it. Identify those faculty and staff who've made a difference and then talk about creative approaches to building those numbers. The program BUILD, B-U-I-L-D, from NIH is for just that purpose. Once we had started having such success with the, with the top students, the question is, how do you take some of the students who are average, more the B-level student, and help them to get to the next level? And BUILD has a lot of money that they've, I mean, the NIH. We, I think we've had two grants, each for $15, $20 million to work with the average students to make them even better using the Meyerhoff model? That would be my answer. Well, I, I really appreciate that. And I know we're running out of time, but I would be remiss if I didn't uh, ask you a couple more things and make a comment, first of all. Uh, I was really appreciative of the way that you took that victory against the uh, University of Virginia <laughs> and used that to bring greater attention to your university in ways that you probably would have had more difficulty doing. That's right. Because I know firsthand from my uh, four years as president of Albany, I never had to worry about UMBC in terms of winning the America East. So <laughs> it must have been when I left that you guys learned how to be competitive. I'm, <laughs> but I'm sorry, I, I couldn't let that pass. <laughs> but, no, we are, the, the, let, me, let me just say to you, we, we, we take greatest pride in being on several occasions national champions of cybersecurity in the country, of stress in the country. We are a nerdy campus. We take great pride in that. <laughs> That's what I expected. I didn't expect you to make a big deal about basketball. I know. I was the most shocked person. My mouth was open the whole time. I'm going, what? What? <laughs> let, me, let me bring it up to you. I know we're out of time here. Uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you a question about the contemporary times in which we live, this climate of, uh, of really heightened attention on racism and injustice, and uh, all of this playing out con uh, concurrently with the pandemic. So from your perspective, what does all this mean in a post-COVID world uh, and concurrent with COVID, because I can tell you some of this stuff we have to do That's while right. COVID is still with us. What would be the sage advice you would offer all of higher education about how do we really use this tipping point around social justice and racism to really bring about substantive change that builds on even what you've done. I'm sure that there's opportunities, yes. lessons you've learned. So what were some of those lessons that you would like to share with us? And then we'll have to, to wrap this up. I'm sure. sure. 
let me say that in that book, Empowered University, we talk about big challenges we had with Title IX. And uh, while we thought we were doing what we needed to do, we were not doing anything like as much. So issues involving gender discrimination, uh, looking at discrimination of any type, whether it's LGBTQ, all the way to right now, the light is shining on, on structural racism. And I'm so glad it is because people have assumed that it was not as bad, but they're seeing it from COVID and the disparate numbers of, 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 of people of color, black and Latinx and Chinese who are with the disease. This is an opportunity to rethink how our universities help to shape the broad critical thinking skills of our society. A time when we should be working on what we do in the curriculum, what we do in the communities, what we do on our campuses to be honest with ourselves. We don't have enough faculty of color. We don't have enough key people. Uh, even when looking at representation on our campuses, the more privileged the campus, the less likely it will be to have many more people from those populations, whether low income or whatever. You're doing things with your commitment, financial commitment, but I think it's an opportunity to help with policies, racist policies in states. Right now, if you, there's an op-ed you'll see that I wrote with the Secretary of Juvenile Services on challenges we face in our state with juvenile of children who are put in jail. The black boys are put in jail much more frequently than the other groups. We've got a special program, the Choice Program, look at it to work on that. The question becomes, how do we look at the different levels of representation uh, to get more people, to get more support for the people who are on the campus? How do we listen to the voices of our students? Because the way we make them feel, they never forget. They never forget. And I guarantee you on your campus and mine, we can do a better job of listening to their voices. And finally, how do we have the honest, robust conversations about race that will teach our students and us, all of us, to look for that middle ground that gives more support to every one of those groups. But at the heart of it will be authenticity. People can tell when you're authentic. I know the people in Illinois who were glad I was there. And I know those who gave me a look that suggested maybe I shouldn't be there. But I'm so grateful for those who said, you can do this. And I will always thank Urbana Champagne. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Freeman. And thank you on behalf of the entire university community for your thoughts and your inspiring comments. Uh, we look forward to continuing the dialogue. Freeman and I have been having conversations all the way back to when I was at Albany about the Marhoff strategy and how we might implement that to build on the success that we uh, had so far, but how do we deepen that success? How do we broaden it? And so uh, we'll be continuing the conversation. Thank you so much uh, for being with us today. And thanks for all of you who participated. And again, I think that the slide with the information that you can utilize to order a copy of Freeman's book should be up on the, uh, on the screen at this point. So again, thank you for this first series, uh, first conversation in our series of great conversations. I can't think of a better way to start this series than with uh, Dr. Freeman Rabowski. Freeman, thank you so much, my friend. We look forward to seeing you soon.